Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. May God bless this to our hearing this this evening. Jesus calls himself the light of life and thereby identifies himself with the truer meaning and the full uh, understanding of the light that they were celebrating from the wilderness. In other words, he's saying the ancient Israelites needed to follow the light to be saved. You have to follow me to be saved. They looked to the light and saw God's presence among them. Look to me and see God's presence in your midst. I'm not just Moses pointing you to the light of God. I am the light of God come down from heaven. Therefore, outside of me is darkness. That was extremely provocative. In no uncertain terms, he was calling himself God. He was equating himself with the authority and the power and the life-giving essence of God. And he was provoking these people. And the rest of the chapter is them being quite thoroughly provoked. They got annoyed at what he said. They argued his point. They, they, they even used a your mum joke on him. They said that his mum was of loose morals, and that's why you don't even know who your real dad is, Jesus, because we all heard the rumor about Joseph. The Yeah, okay, sure, it was an angel, Mary. We all, we all know the truth. They, they start arguing and going back and forth, and Jesus keeps appealing to Scripture and to the Father's authority and the fact that he came from heaven. They were thoroughly provoked. It's meant to be a provocative thought, but it is also what we can't lose sight of in verse 12. Jesus didn't start the fight. They started the fight. He made a gracious invitation, and that's what we're looking at tonight, that if you're outside of Jesus Christ and you don't believe in him and you're not saved, then to you is held out the light of life. And if you're a Christian, this is what we praise the Lord and celebrate this time of year, the light of the world come into our existence. We even sing it at, uh, uh, in, well, in uh, uh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. This whole light theme is very heavy at Christmas. Hark the, uh, hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Does it annoy anybody else that that doesn't exactly precisely rhyme? Do you ever sing it and say, hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Because he's a little bit too you know, OCD to be able to enjoy that hymn. And it's a great hymn. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Now, that's not just tremendous poetry on the part of the Wesley brothers in the 1700s. That's scripture. That's Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, the last book in the Old Testament. Before 400 years of silence, Malachi the prophet says, the Messiah is coming. And, and the, he will be the son of righteousness. Uh, the, the son of righteousness, he says, will, will rise with healing in its wings. The, the rising sun, depending on your status and where you're living and how much protection you have, can be a horrible thing that, that kills you and burns you and dries you out. Or it can be something that brings warmth and life and light. And that is what Jesus will be to any who believe. Or Isaiah 9 verse 2, a, a popular Christmas verse that we, that we read. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. Or Isaiah chapter 60, towards the end of the book, then he he prophesies the coming of Jesus and says, Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Or this light theme continues as we come into the New Testament and you have this guy called Simeon. And he's an old guy. He's not a priest, we don't think, but he had a prophetic gifting. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he was waiting for the, 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 the consolation of Israel when God would send his Messiah. And the Holy Spirit had prophetically told him that he would not die until he sees God's Messiah, the Christ. And he's in the temple one day and he's praying and he's doing his, his duties. And then a poor rural couple hop off a donkey, and they march on into the temple, and they go over to a priest in order to have their child, Yeshua, in English, Jesus, circumcised on the eighth day since his birth. And he sees that child, and he knows that that tiny little eight-day-old child is the fulfillment of not only the prophecy God gave him, 
but the prophecies of all of the Old Testament. He runs up to that child, he picks him up, and he starts to sing a poem, and he says, uh, the, Luke chapter 2, verse 28 uh, following says, He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. This little baby is and would become a light to all of the Gentiles, all of the nations, to every country on earth, and a glory, a culmination, the the whole purpose of the existence of Israel as a nation, and they would and will glory in him. This is why Jesus said, I am the light of the world. 